welcome back to the Grand Ship, the Space Show show. Is that McNoise, Carrie? <sighs> yes. <laughs> he's got it. He's got the safety on his phaser. Oh, there. That's it. I gotta hit that. There it is. I hope it's set to stun. It is. It's is set it? to fun. Oh, God. Okay. Welcome to the Space Show Show, a show where I, a wee baby novice, <laughs> uh, I sit with an expert and talk about space shows. I am your host, Ensign Rebecca Frost, joined by noted Space Show fan, Admiral Carrie Jackson. Welcome back, Carrie. Thank you. Uh, I, <laughs> I got to be honest with you. I look forward to this more than anything that I do. Oh, you know what? <laughs> I get it. I love talking Star Trek. I could talk about Star Trek all day. Well, let's do. Let's begin. Now, we're only going to do, uh, you say, four episodes this time? We're only doing, We're only talking about four episodes this time because we are at the end of season one. I cannot believe I have made it to the end of season one. I never I'm thought honestly, I'd make it this far. Honestly, I'm, I, I, first of all, applaud your stamina. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> or your patience. I can't decide if <laughs> it's the uh, stamina well, or patience. It's a little bit of both because I got to say, this, this string of episodes is kind of like that. This week we're going to talk about Errand of Mercy, The Alternative Factor, The City on the Edge of Forever, and Operation Annihilate. This first episode, Errand of Mercy, with the war with the Klingons raging, Kirk and Spock attempt to resist an occupation of a planet with incomprehensibly placid natives. This one, I of course have given it a name and I call it the Ren Fair episode. <laughs> yes, oh that's good, that's perfect, that's perfect. Uh, and this, this one is so quippy. I don't believe we've had such a quippy episode. It, it is. It's full of little barbs, and uh, you know, Kirk is very Kirk in this one. You he know, is he... so Kirk. There's an there's a, an exchange between Kirk and Spock where Kirk says, "So we're stranded here in the middle of a Klingon occupation army," and Spock replies, "So it would seem not a very pleasant prospect." And Kirk replies, "You have a gift for understatement, Mister Spock. It's not a very pleasant prospect at all." <laughs> Yes, I know what a gift for understatement means, Captain. I, I didn't need you to be a dick about it. Okay. <laughs> uh, this this is our introduction to the Klingons. Yes. Um, and are they a racist caricature? Well, they were supposed to be Russians. They were supposed to be Russians. Yeah, that was that was the the original conceit was that they were supposed to be Russians. Carrie is now showcasing his. What is that? A Klingon ship. This is a, uh, please, a D7 battle cruiser. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one I built, I built uh, during a very lonely time in my life. Uh, and it's, I think, like the last model kit that I ever put together myself. And what year was this? Uh, I, honestly, I can't recall. It, it was between girlfriends. Mm. <laughs> I, was, I was staying out of the public eye and hiding in my little cave and putting together spaceship models. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, interesting. Um, the leader of the Klingons, uh, boy, I can't remember his name, but the way he introduces himself is the same way I um, join podcasts is, I don't care if I'm welcomed here, I'm here and I'm staying. <laughs> I, I, this is Kor, uh, Kor. Who, is one, who is one of the three like most popular Klingons from the original series. So popular that they bring them back for an episode of Deep Space Nine, all three of them. Oh, but this is uh, this is core, and this is the only little core, uh, little bit of memorabilia I have. This is a fridge magnet. I don't know if you can see, oh. <laughs> but, it, but it is a photo of the of uh, core, the, the character John Kalikos, I believe is how you say his name, uh, who later went on to play another bad guy in another space show. He played Baltar on the original Battlestar Galactica. Ah, another show I have not seen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Doesn't this man also play um, like a Vulcan or something? He. Or am I thinking of someone else? You're thinking, thinking of somebody of the, else. I'm thinking of the Romulan guy. Yeah, this guy was supposed to come back for an because he was so popular. He was supposed to come back for another episode, uh, Aaron of Mercy, I believe, uh, which well, we'll that's get this to. One. Uh, yeah, maybe not Aaron of Mercy. It was, uh, <laughs> Day of the Dove, Day of the Dove. This is Aaron of Mercy. Day of the Dove was the one that he, he was supposed to come back for, but he had scheduling conflicts, so they brought in Michael and Sarah to play the Klingon, and they named him Kang, I believe. Hmm. Uh, for that's, so that's upcoming. But anyway, a little yeah, background. This, this one, the Aaron of Mercy, is uh, not killing the Organians, is that? 
Well, the, the message is, is, you know, I mean, you, you've got these two warring factors, the Klingons and the Federation, and they think that they're smarter than the Organians, and they both want the planet for strategic reasons. And the Organians are extremely placid and... Well, they're like, we don't need either of you. Sorry. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the Federation's like, look, the Klingons are just going to come and take your planet if, if you don't join the Federation. And... Well, and they they yeah. haven't evolved in like what ten thousand years. They've been they have not made any technical advancements for like ten thousand years. Technical advancements. Which ah, oh, and then there. This is the, I, I'm noticing more and more this type of thing existing within Star Trek. Um, just right. more incorporeal beings because that's what these people turn out to be is just incorporeal. Whozy what's its Well, see that's 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 part of the being taught a lesson about human hubris, you know. <laughs> yeah. You you think that you know better than the locals, you know, because you you're so smart and you've got all this technology and learning and uh you know these people they they they're living like a bunch of hippies. Well, maybe maybe we're not as smart as the hippies. Truthfully, um if I could live in a Ren fair, uh <laughs> I would take it. <laughs> all the turkey legs i can eat turkey legs and ale for days Mead. Unless, can we talk about kirk and spock's outfits uh because they give kirk this poncho thing whatever we used to it but spock gets um a cape spock gets tights spock gets leg warmers and he is rocking it well that's what a dealer in Kiva Centrillium would be wearing, right? God, you know what? <laughs> this next couple of episodes, or I guess just two episodes in this string that we're talking about, Spock and Kirk get some fun outfits. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> some fun outfits. <laughs> um, and I also, I also like that they, the Organians are like, hey, listen, you two, shut up. You guys you're you're light years behind us you guys are going to be fast friends in the future and both the core and kirk are like -uh, we'll never be friends with these guys <laughs> it was uh yeah it, I, I i can't recall what exactly the lesson is on this one except for you know don't think you're so damn smart it's not all about you yeah i get i guess um the the fun bit of trivia I have for this episode, uh, this episode introduces the Klingon Empire. Klingons were named after Gene Roddenberry's friend Bob Klingan. Klingan. C L I N G A N. I hate you, Bob. I'm gonna name the bad guys <laughs> after you. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if Bob also has is like extremely wrinkled. Now, in this episode, when it was originally, you know, from from the old days, we never got a look at the Klingon ship. It was a budgetary thing. It was just mm -hmm. a flash of light. You know, you'd see a little flash of light, like, like you always saw in the original uh, special effects, because building a model, you know, photographing it, all of that, it's it's time consuming and expensive. We mm -hmm. got to get these shows out. So we didn't get to see the the uh, battle cruiser, the Klingon battle cruiser. Now, in the uh, new effects ones, you do get to see it. Uh, so that so we were we were we had that taken logistics? away from us. What are the logistics of this ship? Because it seems like you got a big, a big ball and platform on top of it, but then a long, narrow string in the middle. Yeah, and then the big, rest of the ship long... is in the back. Yeah, from a design standpoint, not so great because all you'd have to do is just destroy the neck of the yeah. ship, and then your your command center's gone away just... from your. <laughs> away from your other one i just think they're cool looking ships that's all. cool yeah well a lot of cool stuff isn't practical but that's here true. we are that's true um I have, I have several pair of pants that are that way yeah tell me about it uh <laughs> <laughs> let's move on to our next episode the alternative factor this i'm sorry this was such a boring ass episode it was terrible okay it was this everybody yeah. says spock's brain which is season three everyone says spock's brain is the worst episode of star trek i maintain that this one is strictly because of the boredom factor it I, okay i'm glad i'm not alone in this because this was such a boring ass episode Existence itself comes under threat from a man's power struggle with his alternate self, with the Enterprise's strange dilithium crystals presenting his key to a final solution. Um, this also, this episode, not to like jump to the end, but also plays into my fatigue, my multiverse fatigue 
Because, Me? <laughs> because, <laughs> when, yeah, okay. when they got to the part where they introduced the concept of like parallel universes, I, I out loud went, are you serious? <laughs> I cannot <laughs> escape this. I am so tired. But you know what? It's okay. Um, it's I like it's the, a scientific I like... <laughs> theory that's been around for a very long time. So. And do I believe it? Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's well. That's. Ugh. Have you paid any attention to the the UFO whistleblower guy and talking about? Oh, this was like big news in the UFO sphere like oh, a couple of weeks and ago from your from your trip that you took down there. Yeah, where this guy he blew the whistle on. You know, we have alien technology. We have quite a bit of alien technology that we're trying to reverse engineer, and it's not that it's alien and not of this planet, but from other dimensions. You betcha. <laughs> Sell those books. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Which, by the anyway. way, at, at the UFO Festival, at the <laughs> UFO Museum, just a bunch of guys selling their books. Exactly. Oh, and it's I did not want to talk to any of them. <laughs> it's a wonderful grift. It's like the Republican Party that way. <laughs> anyway, yeah, this is the, instead of the alternative factor, should be called the boredom factor. It's a terrible episode. I call, I call this one the ooh crystals episode because they and his, talk a lot about dilithium crystals. And his beard keeps changing and it's. Uh, <laughs> um, and I under, like, reading some of the behind the scenes stuff on this episode, uh, I was fascinated by the behind the scenes aspect of this, but. Uh, and I understand the limitations of what they were working with, but my God, this episode is just pure filler. Like mm -hmm. 20 minutes of it is just that weird effect and people going, whoa. <laughs> <sighs> the spinning, um, the spinning. I got that. God. Do a drinking game that every time the spinning does, you take a shot. You'll be dead. You'll be dead in 40 minutes. <laughs> Literally. Let me tell you about the behind the scenes on this, because that, to me, is really fascinating. John Drew Barrymore was originally cast as Lazarus, but failed to show up for shooting and had to be replaced by Robert Brown, causing the episode to go two days over schedule. The producers subsequently filed and won a grievance with the Screen Actors Guild, which suspended Barrymore's SAG membership for six months. Mm. After Barrymore sh failed to show up on set, the director, Gerd, Gerd? Oswald decided to shoot the scenes that didn't involve his character. On the second day, it was decided to either shut down production and scrap the episode overall, maybe we should have, or Gosh. find a replacement. Robert Brown was dragged into the set right after he agreed to play the role. He recounted the filming to be very tight and tense, which kind of comes across. It does. It, it comes across as the actors don't really know what they're doing, what they're saying, why they're there, you know? Mm -hmm. Which, hey, you know, if you're thrown into it and go, go now, do the, do the scene, <laughs> I can be, see that. Be stressed out. <laughs> uh, and lastly, in the original script, Lazarus romantically came on to Lieutenant Charlene Masters to gain her assistance. The two subsequently fell in love, but when African-American actress Janet McLaughlin was cast as Masters, the romantic angle was dropped. In addition, Gene Roddenberry considered it too similar to the romance between Khan and MacGyver's in Space Seed. As stated by Roddenberry in a season one memo, in both Space Seed and this story, we have a crew woman madly in love with a brawny guest star and flipping our whole gang into a real mess because she is in love. Do they have to do this in two of our scripts? <laughs> Not a, I mean, Gene, that's a fair point, yes. Yes, yes, and but to be fair, th that particular plot point happens so frequently. <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, but this happens so frequently because to skip to season two, um, it kind of happens in Who Mourns for the Adonis? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's uh, well. It was also part of Gene Roddenberry's uh, whole sexual hang-ups that he had. Uh, <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah. yeah. For the time. There, For I did the it. time. People are complaining um, I'm not saying it enough because they want to get drunk while they listen to this show. <laughs> hey, man, you don't need our permission. Like, you can just do it. You can just do drink. It. Every time yeah. we say episode, because I know I say episode a lot. <laughs> I I did like the ending of this episode. I liked that it had a very, from a certain point of view, aspect of it. A very Star Wars-y of them. Um, and... It, I, com I compared it to Kang from Marvel. It's like Kang with just two of them because he's <laughs> the one guy trying to stop himself. Kang <sighs> versus Kang. Kang yeah. versus Kang. And I, I respect a man who's willing to sacrifice himself for all time and eternity to stop a greater evil. I respect the hell out of that. Yeah, but exactly. my but God. 
but uh, you know, we just don't know enough or care enough about you to, yeah. to give us any stakes. You just showed up and you know, that's not enough. I'm sorry. When, when we first see him, he pops up on top of a rock and he's got a very sparkly like suit, like two piece. <laughs> And I, for whatever reason, in my mind, just started singing. It's not unusual because he had a very Tom Jonesy vibe. With that, you know, bad beard and mustache thing. Yeah, go good God, let's talk about that because <laughs> it, cha it changed. It constantly changed. It was clearly fake, and it constantly Ooh, changed. Aggressively fake and bad. You know what? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next episode. It's, yes, I please. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the city on the edge of forever, which is widely regarded as the best episode of the series. Mm -hmm. Written by that grumpy old son of a bitch, Harlan Ellison. <laughs> I have uh, a fun piece of trivia about that. Okay, we'll come to that then. We'll, we'll come to that. When a temporarily insane Dr. McCoy accidentally changes history and destroys his time, Kirk and Spock follow him to prevent the disaster, but the price to do so is high. And uh, in retrospect, I don't know that the price is that high. It's, well, it just yeah. costs you one Joan Collins. No. <laughs> well, but that was, you know, in Star Trek lore, Edith Keeler, for some reason, is Kirk's one that got away. The, you know, <sighs> that was allegedly the love of his life. I mean, you know, he known her for a month maybe, but... So allegedly he never a got week? over it. He liter it literally a week. They get dropped. Okay, okay. Yeah. So McCoy okay. goes right. through the time hole, coked out out of his mind, Assassin! goes through the time hole. <laughs> uh, uh, this episode, I called it McCoy's big day out, uh, yes. even though it, it's more Kirk and Spock's big day out. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, McCoy yeets himself through time and Kirk and Spock <laughs> are like, oh, okay, I guess... Uh, Guess we better go get him. So they go back a week before he gets there. Mm -hmm. And I love when they first arrive. They arrive in 1930, 1930s United States. Yeah, pre-World War II. Pre, uh, grips of the Depression. And they arrive in there, of course, in their uniforms. And as people are walking by, they do this thing where they're like, nobody look oh, at us, oh. please. Mm -hmm. if, if I close my eyes, you can't see me. <laughs> Maybe you won't see my shiny gold shirt if I cover my face. Like, mm, mm, Just mm. absolutely <laughs> insane. And then Kirk steals some clothes. And it it was very much um, that episode of Strange New Worlds from two weeks ago where uh, well, yes. Ron and Kirk get thrown back in time to Toronto, 2023. Because <laughs> it's cheaper to film in Toronto, even Where in the they future. were probably filming anyway. <laughs> even in the future. Uh, yeah. It, it's uh, you know again i i can't explain it it's it, it's it's an episode that uh, i i enjoy it's often quoted uh in star trek lore um i think it, it's to me coming from the future where i am inundated with time travel episodes and time travel stories this story did feel so simple but uh i can understand why people call it the best episode of the series and like one of the best episodes of sci-fi of all time mm -hmm. um, because it is one of the first in TV I think that we see that um, covers the, this concept. There there are people who say that this is a good episode to introduce the original series to people. I don't yeah. know if that's the case because it's so much better than the other episodes that the rest are kind of a letdown <laughs> um i do this would be a good episode to introduce you to the character of kirk i think because kirk yes. has some really great moments in this episode he is i really appreciate that he's not a liar uh every time he's questioned or asked about something he doesn't lie exactly. but he directs the truth in a sort of, in a sort of way that makes it more comprehensible. Um, I also like Kirk as a feminist ally because there's a moment when all the hobos are eating dinner and they're like, okay, now we have to pay the pay our price for this dinner, which is just listening to Edith Keeler talk about, hey, maybe be a good person. Mm -hmm. And the guys are all blah, blah, blah. And Kirk's like, well, I would like to hear the woman speak. And, I, and I'm on my couch <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> feminist ally Kirk. Um, uh, yeah, it's I, there's there's so much to say about this episode, and so much has been said, as you have probably noticed. The 
uh, Harlan Ellison who wrote it. Uh, there is uh, this is not the script directly, even though it's credited as Harlan Ellison. They rewrote the living hell out of it. Mm. Uh, his original version of the script is available in comic book form. You can order that online, I believe. Go, go to Dr. Volz and ask if they can get it for you. Oh. But it's the original Harlan Ellison script, and they illustrate it. You know, uh, it looks great, apparently. Uh, I, I meant to pick it up, and then it sold out. So whether it's still in print or not, I don't know. But Do you know what year that came out? About five or uh, six, maybe you know, my memory, eight years ago, somewhere in there. <laughs> could, be, could, be, I, could be eight years, could be 20. I think if you just look up Star Trek graphic novel, City on the Edge of Forever, it'll probably come up. Nice. I also, I kept writing City on the Edge of Tomorrow in all of my notes, and that's not <laughs> what it is. So the, the piece of trivia regarding Harlan Ellison, Gene Roddenberry apparently denied Harlan Ellison's pseudonym request because he knew everyone in the science fiction community was aware that the Cordwainer Bird credit, at, was, which was his usual pseudonym, was mm -hmm. Ellison's way of sign signaling his dissatisfaction with the way pr the production people handled and treated what he wrote. That would have meant that Star Trek was no different than all the other science fiction shows in mistreating mm -hmm. quality writers and could have resulted in prose science fiction writers avoiding contributing to the program. Exactly. Which I'm glad, um, I'm glad that Gene Roddenberry told him to fuck off because uh, yeah. <laughs> because the show does have some phenomenal scripts and this I think I think it counts as a really good script and shouldn't he, he be just, disappointed. Harlan just kept saying that this is not what I wrote. This is not my story. It's 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 a it's near my story, but it's not. Oh well, uh, the Guardian of Forever, this round thing that they jump through. Mm -hmm. Remember that. So when you go back and watch Star Trek Discovery Season 2, oh. that's all. <laughs> <laughs> this, um, this, one, yeah. this episode did feel really familiar to me. I don't know if I've seen it before. It's referenced so many times that I'm, I'm sure that it's come up in Futurama parodies, I'm sure. Yeah, but when they get to, when they get to the Guardian... Um, mm -hmm. It all felt really familiar to me, and I don't know why. You may have seen it when you were a kid and just don't remember. Ma maybe. Now, now here we go. This is uh, my my action figures. This Carrie's is, got uh, his James Kirk action figure from City on the Edge of Forever, and he's wearing he his jeans and jeans his flannel, and flannel shirt. Yes. And his brown jacket, and I love Kirk. Cannot be bothered to button up his shirt all the way. Hell no. <laughs> if, if Kirk has an opportunity to rock a deep V, he's going to. And then there's Spock, and there's Spock and his, with uh, his beanie and his jeans. And his, and his overcoat, and he's being asked to make a computer out of stone knives and bear skins. I love that Spock was like, I'm going to need plutonium. I'm going to need all of I'm going to need all of these things. Can you just run to the store really quick and get the <laughs> And then here is your Edith Keeler. Are you telling me you have an Edith Keeler action figure? I need to go and dig out my stuff because <laughs> I think I have a nine inch Barbie version of Edith Keeler. Shut uh, up. If I, did, if I didn't sell it, I, I've got it. But uh, there's an Edith Keeler action figure. Right I'm there. begging you to find Edith Keeler Barbie. <laughs> I'll go dig them up. Uh, I, I looked on it. IMDb and Joan Collins has been consistently working her whole life. Until she died, right? Uh, she oh, is she dead? I think she's no longer with us. I could be oh, wrong. Oh, that's so. Uh, I, 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 I believe that. She, oh no, wait, she is still with us. Yes, she's she, ninety years old. That's right. She from is Paddington, still, London. Mm -hmm. She is still alive. I considered putting her on my Deadpool last year. That's right. Oh, that's gonna be a. That's yeah. gonna be a big one. But yeah, she's been working consistently since the 60s mm -hmm. dynasty yeah dynasty um anyway. and i love i love the end um when mccoy you know i love i love a comedy of errors where mccoy is there but they don't know and mm -hmm. they run into each other and the whole thing is edith keeler must she will either survive or she, she will die well, which she is ha in order for the federation to be spawned into existence she has to die uh, mm -hmm. Because if she does not die, then she becomes an influencer and, and the Earth becomes too pacifist to follow the timeline that leads up to the Federation. 
I mean, yeah, that was oh, I guess seemed it like a good yeah, thing. I guess it I guess it doesn't it doesn't start the eugenics war of the 90s. No. And then Kirk and then Kirk is later born on the USS Iowa on a on a <laughs> on a ship that has he's never experienced a sunrise. <laughs> it's a whole thing. <laughs> it's all um, connected. But uh, I mean, they explain it pretty well. They spell it out for you really well why she has to die in order for the future to be the way it goes. I because just, I do her just pacifism. Say her pacifism leads to communism or something like that. And, oh, you know, ew, ew, something. gross. <laughs> I just wish I understood why Kirk fell in love with her after three days and thinks she's the one. The theory is, I'm going to try to explain it. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. The theory is, is that Kirk always felt like he was born in the wrong time. Mm. He felt like he should have been born in the past as opposed to his present. Although it's clearly his his best destiny is where he is. You know, it's this, that's the best thing for everyone is, is that he is where he is. But he oh, always man. felt... He always felt that the old fashioned days were the best. So he oh, was, man. first of all, enamored where he was. And then, you know, here, here's this fantasy woman from an era of where he fantasizes about being. And he, he gets caught up in the moment. Is, that's the explanation. Gotcha. Dang, is that, is that why Paul Wesley in Strange New World seemed to just be having a blast as Kirk in 2023? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting character insight. There you go. Interesting. Uh, the, the last thing I'll say about this in particular is I really love when the gang reunites they run across the street they see McCoy they all reunite and Edith is walking across the street and Kirk's hey. like oh no and you know McCoy tries to save her and he stops him and McCoy says do you know what you just did and I immediately said listen here you coked up shit you don't get <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to criticize anything because you started this exactly. whole mess but then you get that wonderful moment where McCoy just can't believe that Kirk did it. Kirk knows goddamn well what he hit, did and had to do, and he's showing mm -hmm. it. And Spock empathizes. He says, he knows, doctor, he knows. Yeah. He knows exactly what he did. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good episode. A great episode. Um, very simple very simple in my opinion but i mean if it's of the time and the first mm -hmm. of its kind absolutely makes a ton of sense and totally mind-blowing kind of feel sorry for that homeless guy who found that phaser <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> he just wanted he just wanted to steal some milk huh? i just huh and that luke he's skywalker gone. staring into the lightsaber exactly. and the f season finale of star trek the original series season one operation annihilate the Enterprise crew attempts to stop a plague of amoeba-like creatures from possessing human hosts and spreading throughout the galaxy. All right. Eh. <laughs> I remember being a kid and watching this episode for the first time, and I jumped out after the first five minutes. Because, How come? Well, maybe it wasn't five minutes. They go down to the planet because it's all about my brother George is here. Sam, Kirk, ex wow. Sam, Sam. Wow, Carrie. I, I'm getting George Kirk, his father, <laughs> mixed up. My brother Sam is here. Uh, we need to save my brother Sam. Uh, him and his wife and kid are down here. We need to save my brother Sam. They find the brother Sam and he's, spoiler, dead. They roll him over. And it's clearly William Shatner with a fake mustache. And I, I, as a kid, stood up in the living room and went, I'm out. Are you serious? It's literally less than a second that we see him. <laughs> I was like, look, couldn't you just find somebody who looks kind of like Shatner? I mean, and it's, it doesn't have to be his twin you know? <laughs> no but that's what i love that's that's also the piece of trivia i have is mm -hmm. uh mccoy rolls his body over and it's william shatner but he's wearing a mustache the, the blonde mustache yeah. and some light character makeup and but honestly you it's less than a second that they show him and i cannot believe you were like i'm out <laughs> well but then in reruns, the reruns continued and I stuck around and I went, oh, this is an okay episode. All right. um, when, when they first get to the planet and the people come running out with their clear batons, it felt like the beginning of a West Side Story fight. Like I almost expected them to like 
start snapping and break out into song. <laughs> These were actors who were being very actorly. They were oh, told, my, yeah. go out there and tell them to go away. And, and, and you know, so they, they had such, you know, limited direction or something. I don't know that they kept repeating the same thing. We don't want you here. Go Leave. Away. Get out. Leave. No, we, get don't, out of we don't want you. Go on. Get. Uh, I thought it was, I thought it was a very bold choice to have his brother die in this episode and not uh, delve into it more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Cause that's a big, that's a big well, and, thing. But that was, but that was also kind of part of the problem is that, you know, this is Kirk's brother. We should care. Mm hmm. <sighs> Did you? The the only way I felt like we were supposed to care was Kirk repeatedly telling McCoy, "Fix my sister in law, fix my nephew." Like mm, repeatedly, and that's the only. And also, his nephew was like a ginger. <laughs> Well, did you recognize his nephew as one of those kids from Miri? Remember that? Oh, was it? I, I think kind of it was. Assumed, I kind of assumed, but I didn't want to. Yeah. I didn't I Google it because I was like, I just don't care about this kid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do love, I do love it when the bad guys are weird little guys, and so we've got these like plastic, rubbery, amoeba-like things just kind of all over. My my friend Bart referred to them as as uh, fried eggs. <laughs> yeah, Ugh, gross. The, the flying fried eggs that control your mind. God, and when they fly, there's a blooper. I couldn't, I didn't look it up, but there's a blooper where the, when the one goes to get Spock, it lands on his butt. Ooh. And I would like to see that very much. Well, easier access, I would think. But. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. Okay, so these things, they, they sting you like a bee. And they get all up in you and start controlling your brain or whatever. Mm -hmm. And Spock is like, I am, I'm better than these things. And I am in control of my body. And the whole time I am like, I'm to trust this guy. I do not trust. He, he's under the influence of this bug man. Well, I mean, that's the that's the great thing about Spock is that you're like you're with him, and then then he he he'll do something. Like, maybe maybe you shouldn't be. Maybe you shouldn't be. Uh, uh, no 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 no. I got this. I got this. I'm seriously. I've got this. Yeah, and I just did not believe him. Um, but everybody, every, that's the thing I love about Starfleet is ever is a very mm -hmm. trusting community. They're trusting, and they're they do teamwork. And Spock comes up with the idea of how to destroy these creatures, and. He figured he's the first to figure it out, even though he's mostly under control of it. That's how good Spock is. Mm -hmm. And we all wish we could be that strong. And he's the guy who figures out that it's it's this uh, he figures a bright light is is what'll do it. And uh, for some reason, he forgets his eye protection when he does the test. I, I was like, even just little tanning bed goggles. Just yes. give the man some little tanning bed goggles. Something. Uh, but it straight up blinds him. He comes, he walks out of the room all normal, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh my god, it worked. And Spock's like, yeah, yeah. Uh oh, I think I'm blind. <laughs> runs into runs into a table. He says, yes, I've I've taken care of the parasite. I am, however, quite blind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And then and they it's figure a, out it's not it's not bright light, but it's it's uh, it's like some UV sort of, light or something. A UV thing, yeah. And they're like, oh damn, maybe we should have tested it a little bit longer before we blinded Spock. <laughs> <laughs> I know they were just like, we are going to test this right now. Um, and poor Kirk, everybody that's close to him is either dying or going blind. <laughs> I think too, the last couple of episodes have been a little cheeky sneak peek at nurse chapel and spock kind of like oh. oh do they have a thing for each other well because that's that's coming up in the next episode oh my yeah i can't <laughs> cannot wait to get to the next episode of the space show show to talk about a muck time because uh, oh. <laughs> oh another <sighs> one of those episodes that's labeled one of the best now, see, okay. Now, yeah. see, this is, I think a muck time would be the one that I'd introduce Star Trek to people with, I think. Oh, absolutely not. Really? Oh, well, we'll have that discussion on the next episode. Yeah, because it's so not Spock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I see your point. Yeah. I see your point. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, we'll, we'll talk we'll about that next We'll get to it. Episode. We'll get to it. We'll get to anyway, it. Anyway, um, were we done but, with Operation Annihilate? 
Um, yeah, I just want to say, um, Bones, ha- he is, uh, well, because Spock comes down to the bridge and Kirk is like, what? And it turns out Spock, he's like, oh, I forgot. I have, Vulcans have this like inner eyelid thing. We forget about it. Like you forget about your appendix, um, but I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, everyone's- it's, and the explanation being is because Vulcan has, you know, bright, bright sun because it's yeah. hot as Vulcan is the slogan. Uh, oh my God. That, that 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 as the evolution of the Vulcans went on, that they got that eye protection, you know. Uh, and McCoy, McCoy is essentially like, I will die before I ever compliment Spock to his face, and I, I love that for them. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Dios mio. Well, everybody, that... st- everybody stands Kirk and Spock. I think there's some Spock McCoy energy there too. They, yeah, like if they were stranded on an island together, mm-hmm. I, uh, that that trope, enemies to lovers, mm-hmm. love that. Oh no, there's only one bed. What are we to do? Yep, where Kirk and McCoy strictly bros. You know, Stri- stri- the <laughs> best bros. Oh my god, they're the best bros. Has the original series explained where the nickname Bones comes from? Oh, are you asking me? I'm, no. a- I'm asking, yeah. Well, it's just sawbones. It's it's an old term for doctor. Again, there's that ancient oh. Kirk phraseology that, you know, because he loves history so much. It's That's where, and the theory is, is that all the doctors are named after uh, bone breakage of some kind. So you got oh. bones, you got Dr. Crusher, crush the bones, uh, B- Bashir, Basher. How about, how about Mbenga? <laughs> okay, that doesn't work all the way. <laughs> I'm talking up my track ass there. there oh, go. boy. <laughs> well, that that does it for season one of the original series of Star Trek. What a you did banger. It, Rebecca. I'm so, I am a little I, nervous to get into the, the next seasons. I am proud of you most that you made it through one season. Thank of this you. Show. I'm, I'm a little nervous because the type of person I am, I like original flavors of things, right? Like, I like the first of any movie in a trilogy because I always think it's like the best one because mm-hmm. I like just original flavor things. And I'm, and having watched a little bit of season two, uh, they definitely have upped the budget a little bit. And I don't know how I feel about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. I can't. I can't wait to talk a muck time with you next episode. And we will talk about episodes one through five of season two next week on the Space Show Show. Join us next time, and we're gonna keep going places. Live long and prosper forever. <laughs>